this and I'm going to chop out the part where I'm saying I'm recording so that whenever we start, it actually just starts, which is very, very cool. All right. Boom, boom. Everybody can see that. We'll hit play. Give me five seconds and we'll get going. All right, and welcome to another Tidepool webinar. This time we're talking about designing for accessibility with color. My name is Christopher Snyder. Let me stop this screen share real quick and say hello. Hi, it's me. I'm Christopher Snyder, Community Manager at Tidepool. Over there is Paul Forgio. And Paul, he's a designer at Tidepool. Hi, Paul. Hi, how you doing? I'm, I'm doing great because I'm not going to be talking about designing for accessibility with color, but I get to watch this presentation. I'm very excited for this. Um, so as mentioned, coming up, if you've registered for this thing, if you're watching the archives, thanks for that. Um, what we've got coming up today is Paul is going to be talking a lot about accessible color design as it relates to Tidepool. Um, he's got a lot of thoughts about this. This is actually a presentation that he's given to the Tidepool team internally um, a number of months ago, and I've asked him to uh, give a version of this presentation to all of you watching at home. So thanks for that. Um, as we go through Paul's presentation, as we as Paul goes through his presentation, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom interface. You can use that to ask questions of, uh, of all of us, um, of Paul, specific, uh, of Paul uh, specifically, or of the Typo platform if you have general questions about that as well. Um, if you have any general questions about Typo, generally speaking, uh, support at typo.org, when in doubt, is the email address you should be using to, uh, to contact us about anything that you have questions about. Um, as a way to, des to design, the support team would, I guess, hand it off to Paul or anybody off on the uh, design team. Um, Upcoming, while this is a webinar focused on design, I mean, we'll have other webinars in the future that ne aren't necessarily about telemedicine. Uh, there's been a really big telemedicine push at Tidepool to help promote um, the fact that our free software can help um, people with diabetes and their care team and their clinicians uh, in this wild telemedicine present that we're now living in. We've had a number of webinars that we've already published on our website at tidepool.org slash webinars. Uh, we, have another, we also have a number of webinars that are upcoming, including uh, one this Thursday with Amy Jose from Steady Health. And next week uh, with Jessica Adkins and Chris Britt from Everyday Diabetes Center. Uh, again, you can go to tidepool.org slash webinars to uh, register for those telemedicine focused webinars. Um, but that's enough uh, paperwork and process there. I'm gonna uh, disable my screen share and request that we engage the Nori cam. Although based off of what I've seen, Paul, Nori is out for a walk, right? Nori is out for a walk. Nori is my two-year-old Samoyed uh, that lives with my partner and I in our house in Rochester, New York, where I'm based. Uh, Tidepool is a fully distributed team. So we live all over the place. Um, and so, yeah, I'm just going to get started and talk a little bit about who I am and then what Tidepool does in case you're not familiar, uh, and why color is important with accessibility and data visualization in mind. Um, so you all can see my screen. We're good. We're good to Christopher. go. Okay, cool. So my name is, in case you missed it, Paul Ford Joan. Uh, I have been a designer for about eight years. I've been a Tidepooler for three years. Um, I have had type 1 diabetes since I was four years old, and I'm about to celebrate my 30th birthday, so uh, almost 26 years with type 1 diabetes, and I've been a do-it-yourself looper uh, for about four of those. If you're not familiar with what do-it-yourself loop is, it is a iPhone-based application that automatically adjusts insulin delivery, trigger readings. Now, if you are a designer here and you're not someone familiar with type or diabetes or this medical space, um, Type 1 diabetes is a condition that affects your pancreas. It means that your pancreas does not naturally produce insulin. And when your pancreas doesn't produce insulin, your blood sugar readings, the, the amount of sugar in your blood isn't well controlled by your body automatically. Um, that leads to long and short-term complications. And so what happens is a Goldilocks range you want to target for the amount of sugar in your blood. And what loop does is it creates a closed loop. That's why it's called a closed loop system. So it takes the readings from a glucose monitor that you put on your body or you prick your finger, you take some blood, it measures the amount of sugar in the blood as a value. And based on that, you can make a calculation of how much, in, how much insulin to deliver to make sure that you, are, you remain in that Goldilocks range. Um, so that, that's just a quick overview and we'll get into a little bit more detail on exactly what all this means. Um, and the presentation today that I am giving that Christopher mentioned is a talk on color theory, color science, the way that color actually works on displays and how you design for displays when you're doing data visualization for medical software. Um, and the path and the research that I took to get to building an accessible color palette, color system for the design system. So 
color system is a subset of the design system is a subset of how we design for tide pool. Um, and this is sort of that journey that I'm going to be describing today. Um, as I mentioned, tide pool is a, is a series of tools for people with diabetes. Um, so diabetes is a data centric disease. You have a number of different devices. You might have a blood glucose meter, which is a device you use. You prick your finger, you draw a little drop of blood. It provides a reading in a couple seconds of how much sugar is in your blood. And again, you're targeting that Goldilocks range. There are continuous glucose monitors, which are very similar, but what they do is they're implanted under your skin. There's a little needle that goes just under your skin and that every five minutes provides a reading every you know every couple of minutes you get a new value so that you can sort of piece together a picture of the ebb and flow of that glucose value there are also insulin pumps if you're not familiar which automate the delivery of insulin so as your body is alive and your heart is beating and you're taking breaths your body is converting glucose into energy and through these transactional processes of eating something and those being turned into carbohydrates and those being turned into sugar in your bloodstream your body needs insulin to compensate for all this happening in your body naturally in the background. And so what a pump does is allows you to automate that background process so you don't have to do the math in your head and mix long acting and short acting insulins and take multiple injections in a day through a regular shot. Instead, you have a plastic tube, tube that is inserted again directly under your skin that automatically delivers insulin. Um, and what these devices do, if you have a combination of a blood glucose meter or a CGM or a pump, is it allows you to be more precise with your diabetes management. These devices are relatively new in the grand scheme of diabetes management, um, but what they also do is they generate lots of data, and diabetes is a data-driven disease. So every different data point, every decision you make is a piece of data that in hindsight you can collect together and build a picture of what happened yesterday, what happened last month, what happened for the past three months, and understand the patterns and start to decipher different pieces of different actionable insights about how to manage your diabetes better in the future. And so Tidepool is a tool that collects that data from those various devices because different companies manufacture different devices. There are not necessarily standard protocols for all these things and puts them all into one place so that they all share one consistent timeline so that you can see a decision that you made about you ate a hamburger one day, you gave this much insulin for it, and this was the outcome of eating that meal on that day. And being able to look back at those decisions and figure out, I really did a great job that day, or something didn't work out, and let me try to examine and diagnose what went wrong that day, is really powerful to understand how to better manage your diabetes in the future. And that's what Tidepool helps to do, is get the data off of those devices where they're kind of siloed traditionally, where they each different device might have a different piece of software on your computer that you need to install, and then you can try to line up the windows from each different application on your display to make sure that the timelines are kind of roughly equivalent so you can see when you took a reading and when you delivered insulin. That was the original frustration that Tidepool was designed to solve, was putting all of these, this data onto one timeline. Now, in the data visualization of, in visualizing that data, there are a number of different things to take into account. And as if anyone here is a designer, you know a lot of these different variables. So color is one, component of how we would visualize this information. And so you think about the different types of data. I've mentioned blood glucose, I've mentioned insulin, and these different types of data, you can color code them and to make it easier to distinguish at a glance. Now, the issue with color coding them is that color is a very complex topic. And so for those not familiar, color is made up, there are a lot of different ways to calculate a color or to produce a given color and to have a term or a value to distinguish this particular shade of green that's on my shirt versus this particular shade of teal that's on my bench behind me. And so there are, one way to do it is hue, saturation, and lightness, or brightness, or value. And we'll get into the differences between those and why that actually gets very important when you're talking about data visualization and accessibility. Um, but there's also consistency between shades. So if you think about, if you take a particular shade of red and then you rotate around the color wheel to a shade of green, they might mathematically be the same brightness and saturation, but optically they might appear different to our eyes. And that's another issue, again, with accessibility. Um, in the red-green example, there are also social meaning to these things. So if you think about a stoplight, you have green, yellow, and red, stop, slow, go. Um, and so there are lots of different things to take into account, and it's not just a Western-centric point of view. In different cultures, different colors have different meanings. So depth might mean might be associated with black here, but it might be a different color somewhere else. And so these relationships between colors 
there's a lot to take into consideration and I'm not going to get deep into that topic, but we are going to touch on it. And I have some research that we can discuss if there's any questions on that topic as well, as well as the accessibility issues of when you are rotating around this color wheel, when you're trying to build a design system or in a, a series of color palettes to visualize this data, how do you make sure that when you pair these colors up together, they are accessible and they meet a certain level of contrast to make sure that people, no matter what type of vision they have or what sort of accommodations they might need in order to understand the data that you're visualizing, they are all able to interpret this data. So the story, this story starts way, way back before my time in the very early days of Tidepool, where Tidepool had a brand that was developed by an agency. Uh, we worked with a couple of different companies. We developed a visual metaphor, which you'll see in a few slides of connecting the dots um, the Tidepool logo mark, if you saw it in Christopher's slides, is made up of dots and lines. And that is a metaphor of connecting the dots and lines of all the different types of diabetes data in order to create, create a complete picture. Now, we had brand colors, and if you're a designer, you might know that brand colors are one thing, but they're not necessarily great for visualizing data, they're not great for designing interfaces, they're not great from an accessibility perspective, necessarily. And so we started with the history, to jump back, there's a history lesson here. So in the beginning, like I said, we had these dots and lines. We had this visual brand that was developed by a, an agency in San Francisco. We had uh, later, some later revisions that were done to it by another company. We chose to represent the data, or sorry. Just one second, I'm gonna, I, I lost my slide in, I lost my notes. Um, so we established a visual brand. We were looking to be distinct from the rest of the medical landscape. If you look at the medical landscape and if you've ever worked in that space under with the sort of branding, there are a lot of blue skies. There are a lot of people doing cartwheels through green fields and we wanted something distinct. So what we ended up with was a series of brand colors that were very bright and very vibrant. And we had these seven different shades of seven different colors. Now, the issue with this is that these work great for a brand, but when you go to visualize data, once we had this brand established, we needed to start building the tools themselves, and we needed to start visualizing this diabetes data. And having these colors here was a great starting point, but how do you take these seven different colors and build an interface with them? How do you, what happens if you, so if we have seven different types of data, you have seven different colors and you could render that, you could display them in one visualization, but what happens if you need to add an eighth color? How do you find an eighth, a new shade of one of these colors or you add another, another color? And so that was the core of the issue. Now jump forward a while to January of 2019 and Tidepool was beginning to redesign our marketing site. Over time, lots of changes had happened to the product, the app itself, the data visualization. And we had our marketing site, tidepool.org, if you've ever been there, if, if not, go visit, you can check it out. This is the old version. And one of the challenges that we had had was that as the products had evolved, we hadn't been updated in our marketing site. And so we, in January of 2019, launched a redesign of this marketing site that brought parity between the app experiences of our data visualization across our different products and the uh, marketing site itself. And so this was a large undertaking and through the work of building this new marketing site, we developed a design system. If you're not familiar with what a design system is, it is basically a number of building blocks that allow you to build something that looks and feels like Tidepool without having to make a number of tiny little decisions. So you start with these basic components of things like topography and the space in between elements on the page and color, which is what we're talking about today. And so as we built out these basic foundational elements, we decided that we needed to take those seven colors that we had, I had showed you before from the branding and build a whole system of colors that you could use to visualize data in a consistent way so that the dark shade of purple on one page was the same dark shade of purple on another. So what we did was we took those seven shades and we extrapolated them out into these, as I said, these shades. Now, the, this is great from a design perspective because you can emphasize and de-emphasize certain elements in the screen by using these different shades. So if you want to make something inactive, if there's a button that you can't press because you haven't completed filling out a form, you can use one of these light shades of indigo or pink, for example. Or if you really want to call attention to something, you can put something on this dark background and really make it pop on a white, on a, you can have a, a purple button, dark purple button on a white background to really make it pop. Now, 
The issue with this is that, well, getting ahead of myself, this color, these color palettes were built on the material design system. Um, this is a sort of a framework that Google has developed and published that uh, establishes a number of high level rules about how to build a design system. Now I was familiar, I happened to work at Google in the past, so I was very familiar with the material design system and this is my go-to point of reference when we needed to develop these color systems. The, the problem with them is that at the time, material design didn't really account for accessibility when developing these color palettes. So you can see this exemplified here on the right hand side of the screen. This is the same indigo and pink palette. So you have these light shades down to these dark shades. Now, when you look at them as the, the full color versions here, they might look pretty distinct. You can see that both of these are pretty dark shades of pink and indigo. And then these are both very light desaturated versions. But if you were to take these into a design tool and desaturate them as if you were colorblind, you would start to see that, oh, this dark, dark shade of indigo is very, very dark, but this lighter shade of pink is not nearly as dark. And the issue comes with, if you're building a page and you've decided that the theme for this page, if this whole page is going to be set in indigo, and you've set this dark, dark purple indigo as your background, and you put white text on top of it, it's perfectly legible. It, that's great contrast. So you can easily read text placed on this background. But if you at a later point decide that this page should actually be more of a pink theme and you just swap these colors out one to one, then this dark purple becomes this dark pink, but it's not nearly as dark. And so white text on this background is not nearly as legible. And so you run into this issue of people all of a sudden can't read the text that you place on this page. Now you can manually go in and start pushing and pulling different colors and introducing new variables and trying to make this shade even darker or more saturated, more saturated or put make the text black, but then you end up with this issue of consistency of, well, this page, the text has to be black and this page, it has to be white. And on this page, we had to introduce a new color and where are we tracking that color? And how do we make sure that we're using the same shade somewhere else when we have another pink page that we need to develop? So these are all things that design systems need to account for. And in January of 2019, this wasn't something that we had thought about until just before we launched the site, we started to do accessibility testing which is sort of a classic issue in design and development of, oh, this is a box we need to check, accessibility testing. Let's make sure that we meet the requirements and just make some last minute tweaks. But when something like your color system doesn't account for that, you run into lots and lots of issues and this generates a whole bunch of grief with consistency across your product when you have to keep developing new special one-off developments for a particular page or a particular use case. So that is sort of the core of the issue and I'm gonna take you through how we resolved it. But just at a high level, I wanna jump back to this data visualization idea and what the Tidepool product suite is. So Tidepool is made up of a number of different tools. There is Tidepool Loop, which is currently in development. Um, and we're not gonna really be touching on that too much today, but Tidepool Loop is built off of a do-it-yourself project, an effort on GitHub and open source project that you can download and install yourself. Um, it's its own whole separate product from Tidepool Loop. So anything that I reference today will be about do-it-yourself loop, just for reference. There's also the Tidepool web experience, which is where after you've uploaded your data through either Tidepool Uploader or through Tidepool Mobile, which is either an iPhone app or an Android app that goes on your mobile device or a desktop application for your Mac or Windows PC. Um, you upload your di diabetes devices and they are visualized inside of Tidepool Web where all those different devices are collected into this one cohesive data visualization. Um, there's also Tidepool.org as I mentioned, which is our marketing site, which is part and parcel, should feel like the rest of this suite of products. So something that is important across all of these different products is obviously consistency. And so here on the bottom, you can see these two charts are this, visualizing the same data. So this is a screenshot of my personal diabetes data from any give, from some given day. Now, what you can see is that there's a number of differences between these two different visualizations here. And we're gonna dive into some of those different levers that you can pull that I mentioned before of how you visualize the same type of data and what are the implications of how you visualize that data. So in Tidepool, uh, these decisions were all made a long time ago and we are working through iterating and we're, this, is, th this document is a, are an artifact of the discussions that we're having internally. So we, blood glucose, as I mentioned, has a sort of Goldilocks range, 70 to 180 here. 
And so when you're in range, you could visualize each different in, uh, in range, below range, above range as their own distinct segment. So what we did in Tidepool originally was create those hard cutoffs. So you can see here, if you are between 70 and 180, you have these greenish dots that indicate that your blood glucose reading is within this range and so everything is good. And then when you fall below that range, we have a different color that we use to indicate this is below the, the target range. Now, this leads to those cultural connotations as I said before. So you think about red and green, stop and go, pass and fail. So even though this is technically a salmon color and not a pure red, there's still this implication of, well, these, I, there's a red series of dots at the bottom of this line, so therefore, anything below 70 must be bad, must be failure, must be a warning. Now, it is something to keep in mind that some, something below, a blood glucose reading below 70 could be considered dangerous by some people. I personally keep my blood sugars relatively on the low side, um, but there's a certain judgment to having this hard cutoff and saying, well, anything above 70 is good and anything below 70 is bad. Um, and it gets even more complicated when you think about is 69 really a bad value and how much better is 71? So just something to think about and we'll come back to this in a moment. Now this is the do-it-yourself loop application. The readings here, this is a, these are the same readings. Now the differences here are that one, they're all the same color, which means that there's no judgment. There's no, oh, I'm in range, I'm out of range. Now there's an upside and a downside to this. As I said, there's no judgment. So you don't feel like the application is making an evaluation on whether you're succeeding or failing or whether you're in a, whether you're in a dangerous range or whether you're in a safe range. The issue with it though, is that it makes it harder to distinguish what exactly is this value. If I'm trying to figure out any given data point, what exactly is the value of this, this point in this chart? <clears throat> the other thing here is that this chart in do-it-yourself loop is dynamic. The chart scales based on the highest and lowest reading on the chart, which means that at any given point on your phone's display, this point here might not always be the same value depending on how high and low of a value is being displayed on that chart. That's a whole other issue. In doing this research, I also looked at a number of other tools in the space that visualize medical data and various types of fitness data and all of this. This is a tool that I like called Gyroscope. And this is visualizing, again, the same data, different day actually in this case, but it's showing blood glucose data. And what they did here is visualize the range with a gradient. So rather than a hard cutoff of saying 69 is out of range and 71 is in range, they use a gradient to indicate, well, in range is anything that's green. And as you start to get low and you start to head down towards the 60s and the 50s, you end up with a, a greenish yellow and then a yellow and then an orange yellow and then an orange and then a red. And so this helps to, it, it makes it less judgmental and it gives more, more granularity to the ranges and how you might deal with your diabetes personally. The problem with this is that again, it creates more mental overhead of, well, how yellow is that yellow? Is that more of a orangey yellow or more of a greeny yellow? It's hard to distinguish. The other nice thing that they do is that they show the outliers. So the highest and lowest values on the chart have labels rather than needing to have a number of horizontal rules. But again, it's a trade-off of it contextualizes the data on the chart and you understand the highest and lowest points, but it makes it hard to, just to figure out where exactly, what is the value of this data point at this peak here? So again, all this number of trade-offs number of trade-offs. Um, so as I mentioned, there are a couple of key questions to this data visualization. Do you highlight and categorize above, below, and in range? Are they hard cutoffs or are they a gradient? Do you keep a dynamic scale or do you use a stack scale? The, the thing about blood glucose readings is that there's only, there's, there's a relatively wide range, but it is a definite range of, you can't go below zero. If you are at zero, you're probably unconscious and that's a bad thing. But you don't really have to worry about accounting for negative values on a chart like this. There, the high values can go up to a certain range, but the thing about these, the devices that measure your blood sugar is that they can only get to a certain point before they just tell you that your reading is high. You should really probably check in with your doctor or head to the emergency room. So there's a maximum value that we need to compensate for, but Anything in between those, we can just build a chart that can visualize from that lowest value to the highest value, and you don't need to take into account a value like 28 million. So that's the nice part. Um, 
Hey, Paul, I got a question real quick. I think this is actually sort of relevant here. This is from Jessica. Yeah. Thank you, Jessica. Yeah. She says, uh, what are your thoughts on the more extreme peaks and valleys of the dynamic scale? And this is from her perspective, she actually is a UX designer with 30 years of diabetes experience. Nice work on 30 years. Um, but yeah, thoughts on the, on the extreme peaks and valleys? Yeah. So I, as I mentioned, I use do it yourself loop, which is a tool that has that dynamic chart as you we were talking about here. Um, I also, so the interesting part is that I also use the Dexcom app. I wear a Dexcom CGM on my body every day and that has a static scale. And so there are upsides and downsides. And we've talked a lot about this at Tide Pool of how there are trade-offs to both. And there's, so I honestly don't have a good answer about one being better than the other. I think it really depends on the context of if, if, if an individual starts to build a relationship with an application and uses that, looks at that chart every day, day in and day out, like Loop or um, the Dexcom app or potentially Tidepool if they're really engaged with trying to like make a change to their therapy, um, then that, that static scale can be great because you start to develop this relationship, this muscle memory of, oh, a point at this point, if there's a dot on this part of the chart, then that means it's this value. And you start to develop the secondhand, don't even have to look at the labels. You just see it and you understand where you are on the chart. The issue with it is if you're perfectly steady all day, if you're having a great diabetes day and you're 90% time in range that day, then you're wasting so much of the real estate of your display on nothing, right? So if, you, if your chart goes all the way to 400, but you've only, the maximum value for the day has been 140 because everything is going perfect that day then everything from 140 to 40 is just kind of a waste that day. So definitely a trade-off. I don't really have a, a like, this is the right decision, um, but I'm interested in anyone's perspective. So if you yeah. leave it in the Q&A, then I'd love to read about it after the presentation or we can talk about it in Q&A at the end. Cool. I, think, I feel like we sort of touched on an opportunity for a separate webinar talking about like scales and this sort of thing. There's another follow-up comment from Henry asking about how you feel about um, sort of evaluating logarithmic versus linear scales. And again, this is not sort of the color thing, but I think while we're here looking at all these different dots, any thoughts on, on how to, uh, how to uh, account for those different sorts of scenarios? Uh, that is a great question. And unfortunately, so we have a number of data scientists. I hang out with one of them, Ed, almost every week, and we chat about data science and data visualization and how to analyze these things. And we both bounce ideas off each other. And unfortunately, I honestly don't know the difference between logarithmic and linear scale. So I can't really answer that question for you. I like, I can Google it and I can Wikipedia it real quick and then understand the difference again. But just those terms as a question thrown at me verbally, I, I don't know. So um, that's a great question and definitely something that I need to dig more into. Um, but I, I don't really have a valuable thought on that. Cool. All right. I'm going to take this last one and then I'm going to let you get back to the slides. This is a comment from Arlene. Have you guys played with the, the idea of allowing users to dynamically set the values for your ranges? Uh, yes. In Tidepool, Arlene, you can actually choose your high and low threshold. So our default value was actually set to 70 and 180. But as the person with diabetes using Tidepool, you are in full control of your data. So you can set your targets to be 100 to 120 if you want to, um, or, you know, uh, 70 to 250, um, whatever you want it to be, that's up to you. And then our data visualization will respect and reflect those changes in those settings that you've made. Um, now, and I, I will comment just on that because there's a whole social psychological perspective to that. So I, as someone who is very tightly wound and tries to keep things very dialed in with my diabetes management, had previously set my range to a very tight, I think I was like 80 to 150 for my target range or something. And so I had narrowed that band down. But what that meant was that my time and range was always really low because I was not often, you know, if I was 151, all of a sudden I'm out of range and it's considered a high glucose value. So right. definitely a trade-off and something to keep in mind. And that's something that I think a lot about personally because I've been there and I've, I've played with those values. And so I started to make judgments about my management and how I was doing with my diabetes because I had tightened that range down. And when I set it back to the, you know, medically validated 70 to 180, that all of a sudden I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I have much better time in range all of a sudden. Um, yeah. So definitely something to think about there. This um, is, I think, a, a full on other webinar we have to do. Um, yeah. So Arlene actually sent in a follow-up comment on this. She's actually talking about the actual view of the height of the chart. So allowing users to sort of set mm -hmm. those values on the axes, I believe. Um, that seems like a whole other can of worms to potentially engage in as my cat is about to jump on the table. Um, in terms of the, yeah, the Dexcom like how app much customization do you allow for that, right? Yeah, the Dexcom app allows you to cap the chart at either 300 or 400. So that's, you know, one fifth, one fourth of the chart height you can remove. And so if you reach beyond 300, it just sort of appears at the top of the chart. And then you're not yeah. necessarily visualizing 
data that needs, you know, it, it's important data if you're that high, but also generally the action you will take when you are that high is usually pretty consistent. You need more insulin. Um, so yeah, definitely a topic that we can dive more into at a later point. So if there's interest yeah. in that. All right. So uh, yeah, for everybody else, keep those questions coming in. We'll, um, we'll have another round of Q and A when we get to the end of Paul's presentation, Paul, I'm going to hide my screen and let you get back to work. Yeah, no worries. Um, so as we were talking about, there's a number of different discussions that we could have about how to visualize this data. Um, one other important thing to think about is like I mentioned, these social con connotations to these colors. So a little interesting backstory in the history of do-it-yourself loop. Uh, the developer who originally worked on do-it-yourself loop, who started this project, um, happened to use Novolog insulin. So there's a couple of short acting insulins made by different manufacturers, and they all kind of do generally the same job. And you might pick one rather than the other because of insurance availability or cost or an allergy to one or the other or better effectiveness of one or the other. And for this person who developed the original do-it-yourself loop, they happen to use Novolog, which is this orange capped insulin on the left. And so they created this approximation of the digital and the physical world where the insulin in the app experience they were designing was the same color as the cap of the insulin that they, they were using in the real world sitting on their desk when they were changing their site. And so this is great. It creates this relationship between the physical world and the digital world and it reinforces, oh, this is the insulin. I know that because that's the color of the vial of the insulin that sits in my fridge or on my desk. Now the issue comes if you're using Humalog, one of these other short acting insulins that happens to have this burgundy cap where all of a sudden that orange color doesn't really mean a whole lot to you because every time you go into the fridge to grab a vial of insulin, it's burgundy, not orange. And so just something to think about where you can create these connections and like these parallels between the real world and you know meet the user where they are. But you have to also account for users in different places and different means of treating their diabetes and different ways to treat their diabetes and different um, you know, artifacts such as having a different colored insulin um, and how that takes into effect, how that affects the, the design of the interface and the color choice that you use to visualize this data. Um, finally, there, so these are a couple of examples on the right hand side here of um, some charts and some calculations from the tide pool experience. So all of these things on the right-hand side, actually all these visualizations show insulin. Um, but the thing about it is that there are many different types of insulin delivery. And so basal insulin is, as I was describing before, your, your heart beating, you breathing, blinking, walking around the house, all generates, all uh, requires insulin for your body to keep functioning. And so that is called basal insulin. Just by being alive and being in the world, your body you know, consumes energy and needs insulin to have that transaction occur. And so we track that as basal insulin. And bolus insulin is if you are eating something, you're logging carbohydrates and you, you calculate the carbohydrates of what you've consumed, and then you need to deliver bolus insulin to compensate for those additional calories, uh, carbohydrates that you've eaten. And so we use two different shades of blue to indicate that because they're both insulin, it's just how the insulin is being delivered. Um, and over time, this, this sort of structure got more complex because uh, insulin pumps and devices started to automatically deliver insulin, for, depending on your blood sugar reading, like Loop does. And so the complexity to that is, well, so we need to visualize bolus and basal insulin, but we also need to visualize, is this insulin being delivered manually by the user? Are they punching in values on their pump? in order to deliver a bolus? Or is it the device itself saying, I see your blood sugar is rising, I'm going to deliver more basal insulin than regularly scheduled. And so this was an early, an early design decision that I made of how do we visualize this distinction? And so we added a new shade of blue or cyan in this case, and then we created these visual indicators. And this isn't a great design. It's been a while since I made this, these design decisions. So I would love to revisit this, but lots of stuff going on. Um, so that's one lever you can pull is color coding these elements. The other thing that you can do is obviously shape, and there's a number of other things that we can do. So that little orange chart here, the basal insulin is the line chart, the line graph here that fluctuates, and there's a little bit more insulin being delivered for a period of time before eight o'clock, and then just before 8 p.m., the amount of insulin being delivered by the basal goes down, and then it resumes back to the regularly scheduled basal just after 8 p.m. And those triangles are boluses. So using shape to distinguish the different uh, the different types of insulin delivery rather than color. And these are both things, you can, you can use both. You could use one or the other. There are other things you can do rather than just shape or color. 
but there are these basic foundational building blocks you have to think about as you're designing these data, this data visualization. Um, as if this wasn't complicated enough, there are quite a few things that you need to take into account when you are thinking about data visualization and diabetes. Um, Adam Brown has a uh, is a has published a number of different discussions on how to manage diabetes, and he at a, a couple of years ago published an article about the forty three factors that affect diabetes. So there are a ton of them. There's stress. There are hormones. There is food, and it's not just carbohydrates, but it's fat and protein. There are a number of different things. And Ed, the data scientist that I mentioned before with the logarithmic linear scale, um, and I sat down and thought through, and we came up with about 90 of them if you really want to get really fine-grained about all the different things that can affect how your blood sugar is traveling up or down. Um, so this is just a short list of things that are on the top of my priority list of things that I would love to get visualized inside of Tidepool at some point in the future. And no promises, we're not, this is not a roadmap in any way. This is just things that Paul thinks is very interesting and would love to look at. Um, but if you were to try and color code or visualize all these different types of data, you start to think about the relationships between activity data has a lot of different components. There's heart rate, there are steps, there's calorie, there's physical activity of running and biking and swimming and weightlifting and all of this. And the complexity to that is for activity, for physical activity, um, running can lower your blood sugar, where weightlifting can raise your blood sugar, depending on the intensity and the duration of the, ex the exercise. And so visualizing this information is really important if you're trying to piece together a retrospective look at what's been going on with your diabetes. But there are also colors that are attached to some of these things. You think about if you draw a heart, usually you'd pick red to indicate a heart because that's the color of blood and the heart pumps blood. So does that mean that all activity data should be red because heart rate has this color association or should it be some other color that we pick that's not already being used by one of these other data types? So this is the complexity of trying to develop a system that can account for all of these things. And also thinking about the future of as we add new data types potentially, how do we accommodate, how do we leave room in a color spectrum for new data types that we need to visualize when it's something completely separate like sleep data or tracking stress levels or therapy settings changes so that you're looking at how your time and range has been changing over time and all of a sudden you need to look at um, was I more in range before this change or after this change? And so all these things are different levels, you know, different building blocks you need to pile on top of one another as you think about building a visualization of how to show all of this in real time over time. So that is just a high level overview of all the different pieces and parts that go into visualizing data in a tool like Tidepool. Um, I'm gonna jump back for a second and just kind of talk about the building blocks of color because this really gets into the crux of the issue now. So if you think about how do you define a given color, you can give it a name. We can talk about carmine versus um, azure versus blue, but that gets messy pretty quickly and it's very hard to define what exactly is this particular shade of green here. Is this more of an evergreen or more of a dark green? Um, so there are a number of ways to do this, obviously, um, and a lot of them are mathematically based. So the different building blocks of color, at, and th these are my definitions, so if you're a designer, you can please argue with me, tell me that I'm wrong in the comments and come up with a better definition than I have. This was me late last night trying to come up with the definition. Um, but hue, if you take the most vibrant version of any given color across the rainbow, that is the hue. So the most vibrant red or the greenest green is, a particular, you know, take that and that is the, the most vibrant version of any given color. Now, you can also affect the saturation of it. So if you take that reddest red and you turn down the saturation as if, it's a, as if it's a dial, a volume knob, you end up with a perfectly neutral gray. And so this spectrum here, if you go, if you think about in a real world example, if you walk into a paint store and you ask for a white to paint your wall, they'll say, well, do you want a warm white or a cool white? Now, what this is, that, that is a very desaturated version. That is just a white. But what they do is add a tiny bit of saturation, a little bit of a blue or a red or a yellow to create a warm or a cool white. And so that is this level of saturation. And then the last component is lightness or brightness or value, depending on which system you're measuring from. And so this is pretty simple, pretty self-explanatory. So if you think about being in a dark building and you walk out into the midday sun, that is lightness. That is how much light is around you in the environment. And so think of it in the same way as 
when you walk into a dark room and you turn a light on, all of a sudden the brightness immediately jumps up to a different value. And this is the same thing for color where you have a dark, dark, dark red that all of a sudden you turn up the, the lightness and it becomes a pink. Um, and these three components together allow you to reproduce basically any visible color given a spectrum on a certain display. So this is where it gets complicated because there's a big problem with these models of hue, saturation, lightness, brightness, value, RGB, all these calculations, they're all mathematically based. So the issue with this is that displays don't, can't reproduce every single color that our human eyes can perceive. And so the problem is that red is actually re reproduced pretty well. And so you can have a very vibrant red, but greens and yellows are harder to produce such a vibrant light version of such a shade. And so if you look at this chart here, this is based on hue, saturation, brightness, or any of the traditional sort of color theories, any of the traditional color um, protocols, I guess. I don't, I've, I need to come for the, I, there's a better term than that. But if you look at this, purplish blue here, you can see all of these are mathematically the same level of lightness. They're all 60%. And so you look at this white text on this purple background, it's very easy to read. But if you go to this lime green here, all of a sudden it's almost impossible to read, even though mathematically they are the same distance. They're the same point on that lightness slider. They are very difficult. There's a big difference between these. And so it's the same thing. If we turn this image grayscale, all of a sudden you'd see how dark this purple is and how light this lime green is. So this is the crux of the issue. And just another way to visualize that is this is the color space of what an average monitor can display. So this came from another data, another way to visualize color and another color spectrum called HS Love, which is a developer, well, they claim it's a developer focused color spectrum. It's actually something that I'm highly interested in. I'm, I, one of our backend engineers actually sent us this. Talk about that later. Um, but this spectrum here, the problem is that you can have this very saturated, very bright red, but that there's not actually a way to reproduce that saturated of a green on many displays. And different monitors have different, your phone display is different than your iPad display is different than your laptop display is different than your TV. But this is the issue is that when you display something on one monitor and you display something on another monitor, there are discrepancies between the two of them. Now, as a designer, I would love to send everyone a color calibrator and get all of their displays perfectly calibrated so we can know that everyone's display across the world, no matter where they are, is always going to display the same shade of red that I picked in my design tool. But that's not a realistic expectation. We cannot do that, unfortunately. And so what we need to do is instead compensate for these limitations built into the displays and the way that these displays reproduce color. Which brings us to the way that I developed the new tide pool color system. And so this is based on a bunch of research. I'd mentioned it before, but this is really built on, so our founder Howard talks about how do-it-yourself loop and tide pool loop are built on the shoulders of giants. Every, the only reason that we are able to work on tide pool loop is because we're standing on the work of every person previous to us that there were a number of steps along the way that brought us to where we are today, where we can work on this product. And in the same way, that's exactly what I did. I, did not do anything revolutionary with this work. I am just sharing the story of how I came across all these different discussions and articles and tools and theories that people have developed over time to try and compensate for the limitations of how we display color on a display like this. Um, and so I just wanna call that out, that this is not work that I really did. I'm just telling you the story of all the work that these other people did. And I did not want to go through a huge list of tools and articles, but I do have them in the footnote, in the appendix of this presentation. If there are questions about them, I'm happy to go through them. Um, and Christopher and I are also working on a blog post version of this discussion where we will have links to all of those different tools and articles and color theory where you can go and there will be some quick summary notes of what was interesting about them in developing the, the color tool, the color system that we built. Uh, yes, I see you're exactly. that'll, be, that'll be up on typepool.org slash blog and there'll be uh, plenty of announcements about all of that. It'll be it'll include an archive of this presentation, but more, more importantly, a links to all of the resources that Paul um, will be uh, mentioning as we go through. Uh, yeah. Paul, just an FYI, um, yeah. we had scheduled 45 minutes. We're at 45 yeah, minutes. Yeah, I see we're at about 40 minutes now. But this is also the best part of the presentation. So we're going to go a little long uh, beyond the schedule. But so everybody stay, you know, hold, hold on to your boots. This is going to get really good. Um, go ahead, Paul. 
Uh, yeah, I, I can run through this pretty quick too. So um, the new Tidepool color system trademark, just kidding, Tidepool is an open source company. All of our designs, as long as they are not something that is um, still under development is all open source. And so uh, we are working to publish all of this in an available format so that anyone can go back. You know, there'll be the blog post with all of the research. We're also working to publish all of these design specs and stuff, you know, put it on a URL, have a design system published so that you all can reference this. If you're interested and you can tear it apart and tell me all the ways that I'm wrong, I'm interested in hearing all about, all about that. Um, so what we did was we looked at a number of different uh, design systems and different calculations of ways to calculate color and build color systems and color palettes and color ramps. And the output of that was a series of color palettes. Um, so these are the, you know, as I mentioned before, the design system for Tidepool, we have these basic foundational building blocks and these are the colors. Now, it's more than just this. Um, so obviously, if you grayscale these, something that we wanted to compensate for from the accessibility perspective was making sure that you could swap out a green for a dusk for a red and not have to worry about accessibility. Now, this is not perfect. You'll see that the slate here gets a little dark a little early and the purple stays a little light a little long. But for the, this is actually, like this is very hard to do, as I said, and it's not something you can do mathematically. It's something you have to do optically and you have to really kind of fine tune these levers in order to perfectly balance them across the spectrum. Now you can ultimately get to the accessibility calculation that the WCAG has done and I'll get to that in a moment. Um, but this is a lot better than the previous iteration that we had done. And this is informed by an open source project called Mineral UI, which again, will be linked in the blog post and stuff. Um, but they did a lot of this work and what we, what I did was essentially take our brand colors and our, our existing colors that we were using across our data visualization interfaces and map them in between sort of the, the system that they had already built. So it's really reliant on what Mineral UI did and they built on a number of other people. And so, like I said, standing on the shoulders of giants. And so I, that whole path of all the different people that are referenced in building the system will again, all be linked. Um, so we threw in our brand colors and then what we did was I started to calculate, okay, what is the accessibility of the different shades? And so I, and it's a little hard to see here, but I can flip over to a different screen in a moment where I actually calculated all this out into a rough design tool. It's a, it's a Google spreadsheet. It's not nothing fancy, but the, the RGB values, the hex values of each different color and the contrast rating of whether it's double or triple, triple A accessible and the contrast ratios, which you need to aim for in order to make sure that these, these colors are accessible. Um, and so we built the system and then we tested and validated it. And as you can see here, like the light mode here is pretty consistent across the board other than that gray, right? Where the dark mode is a little less consistent, but still you have one or two values that you're going to choose that you can make sure is gonna be accessible across the board. So you have these different shades and if you have a green 50, you know for sure that that will be fine on a dark background. Um, and so from there, I took that, that work and I built a couple of concepts. And these are obviously just very simple little chart data visualization examples here, um, but how does it work? And one of the failures that I had seen across a number of tools that was starting to be accounted for when I did this research back in um, early, you know, mid 2019 was that lots of accessibility tools would look at pure white and pure black on a color, but they wouldn't look at any other combination. And when you think about designing an interface, yes, you have pure black and pure white, but a lot of times you don't want to use the absolute FFF or 000, the purest version of a color. You want to mix tints and you want to, to in order to create a visually appear, a visually pleasing interface. And so what I did as a result of this, was build a uh, color system here where we calculated out every different, so what we have is different shades of dark and different shades of light and different colors and different calculations and the color contrast for each one of them. And so this was a lot of manual work of transcribing these things into the spreadsheet, but what it allows you to do is say, okay, I cannot use this 50 shade of purple on this light gray. And so, there are a bunch of different ways to visualize all this information here. Um, and these are a lot of the kind of the same building blocks here. But um, the outcome of this work was the ability to build a map. And this is really kind of the legend of the map to say, 
yes, you can put this shade of dark blue on this light gray and it will still be accessible and it will be double A accessible. And so this is really key because as we're building our design system and we are building, you know, components and, you know, web development stand, you know, building to modern web development standards for Tidepool Web and for our mobile application for Tidepool Loop, we have these points of reference. And rather than having to talk about the hex value of, um, F5, F7, FA, you can just choose, uh, you know that teal 70 is fine on this light shade of gray. And so that's just the high, that's kind of the high level overview. Um, I am, I know we are, you know, five minutes over, I guess already. Um, so I am happy to answer any questions. I'm happy to be berated by people who know more than I do about this. And I'd love for you like to hear, talk with you about this. Um, or I can dive into, as I said, I've got a ton of, different examples of all these different tools and we'll be posting this on the blog um so we you know we can dive into that if anyone has questions as well um so thank you paul uh i just from my perspective if people watching this like these are the types of fascinating and nerdy conversations that i get to be part of and i just get to one thing i work with some really intelligent people but also two i get to get a better appreciation for the complexity of the work that we're taking on and then as a result the complexity of just any sort of uh, app development or web development when you start to think about being uh, inclusive to as wide an audience as possible uh, to get it right it takes a lot of a lot of care and a lot of thought um, I do have one question in from Jackson uh, what is a good first step to take with the existing brand style to either modify or update it for accessibility so in terms of your process Paul where do you where did you begin if you can think back a year ago pre pandemic yeah so um... As I mentioned, you know, we, we had these established kind of couple of colors that we got from, you know, we were using as our brand colors. And so what I really did was if you look and you sort of do these calculations of contrast and brightness. And so you look at, I, I kept referencing um, hue, saturation and lightness or brightness or value. And if you, you can start to calculate these out. So if you bring them into whatever design tool you're using, you can look at an existing design system and say, okay, roughly all of these 90 values, all of these second darkest shades of any different color have a brightness of around you know, 10%, right? Because it's a spectrum that's mathematically accurate that you can calculate. And so you can start to build that map and say, well, okay, so the, the 100 shades are all 5% brightness and then 10% and then 20% and then 30% brightness. And what you can do then is take any of your given brand colors, your hex values that you might have, and you can, look at the hue saturation and brightness of them and figure out, okay, well, where does that fit? This particular shade of indigo is, is that closer to a 40 shade or a 50 shade of a color in this spectrum that we're looking at? So it's really kind of just like throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. Look at other existing design systems. And like I said, I looked at Mineral UI and that was a tool that was, it was, it was a well-supported design system at the time. Unfortunately, that company actually got bought out. And so the system's no longer supported. But the, the work still stands on its own. So anyway, I would, I would do some research and look at different color systems that take into account accessibility and material design is one and the mineral UI and uh, Lyft has a tool called Colorbox. Again, we'll link all these different things. Um, but you can take any one of those as an example and look at kind of the steps that they've defined for each different color in their spectrum here. And then take, one of your, take all of your brand colors, figure out where they map. And then you can extrapolate that out and start to increase the brightness and decrease the brightness to build out that one brand color you have into a full spectrum. And that's kind of, as I said, this is kind of the manual tedious process of doing that by hand and also making sure that it looks good and then going back and double checking the accessibility ratings. Um, but that's, that's the, the means that I took. And if someone has an automated do, way to do that, I would love to hear about it. <laughs> That sounds really good. Um, okay, so we got a couple more questions in. These there are two quick ones from Karen. Um, going back a bit to the uh, to the data visualization, um, specifically around the different scales. Um, what's your opinion on the Dexcom trend graph? Um, so I guess as Paul, person with diabetes, uh, what what, did, what is your thought on how on how the Dexcom app displays that trend graph? Had to be careful there. Um, so you can see, obviously, I didn't bowl us enough for my my granola bar this morning. Um, so you know. <laughs> It's, it's non-controversial in my opinion. And I, I say this as a person who's been using Dexcom for years. And so I've kind of just gotten numb to it, I think. Um, the, I, you know, I, as you can see, I, I leave my chart at, you know, only, it goes, only goes up to 300 because if it goes up to 400, I'm not often riding around 400, 
which means that um, it's kind of wasted space. So that comes back to this core question of, you know, dynamic versus static scale. Um, right. Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, I know a lot of, I've talked to a lot of people who have issue with the do it yourself loop dynamic chart scaling and they go, oh, but like, I, I don't know where things live. And I think there's definitely value to that. Um, I think it's non-controversial. Uh, like I said, the, the, yeah, there are a number of design decisions that I kind of, I would love to talk to the people at Dexcom to understand why exactly they, you know, they, they decided to highlight the current value in this way and why this, you know, why is there such a thick line between the in range and the above range? And if I fall into that little white stroke in between the gray and the yellow, what does that mean? And right. why is there such a, so anyway, lots of little detail questions. Um, that so, only yeah, a designer would care about, about it, right? If, yeah, if exactly. you are someone who's interested in that as well. Cool. Another one from Karen, uh, what branding conflicts have you run into? Um, that's that's a great question, especially as we can't yet talk about tide pool loop. Um, um, so well, so we can't talk about tide pool loop. I, I can talk about the color palettes just in general, not without naming any specific. I believe Chris, right? Sure. So Go for it. I can just say, you know, tide pool. As I mentioned before, we we have these brand colors, and we we've, we've refined them over time so that you don't you don't see a lot of this pink in our branding and our marketing materials. There is a lot of this purple and this dark purple. Um, and obviously, I mentioned before this green and this pink. You have this, you know, red green stoplight. These issues, and so you know, in explore, we were doing explorations and thinking about how do we visualize this data in loop, and how do we visualize it in tide pool, the tide pool products themselves, and how do we turn all of these, you know, the, we have these two separate products, and how do we bring cohesiveness between them? And so thinking about the the way that we the colors that we're choosing and making so especially with the blood glucose value, it's sort of the end result of a number of decisions. It's, it's the 90 different factors that make up your life, happen, that you happen to have diabetes and what goes into that. It's also the amount of insulin you're taking and the amount of carbs you're eating and all these different things, what you're eating, when you're eating, when you're exercising. And so to use anything that has a sort of cultural connotation of success or failure on the glucose chart was something that we really wanted to try and stay wide away from because making the chart green or red is something that um, is, you know, is, is pretty loaded. You, you end up, you know, are you always succeeding? Are you always failing? Even, you know, if you're 400 and green, does that mean that someone will look at the chart very briefly and go, oh, I'm good, it's green. Or if you look at the chart and you're 100 and perfectly in range, but you are red or pink, you go, oh no, so, oh, never mind. I'm 100, I'm 100. It, it's fine. Um, so, like that particular detail, I think is something just a, a small little example I can give, you know, in the work we're doing across all of our products, including tide pull loop and thinking about very carefully, how do you account for things like that? Yeah. Um, all right. Question from Sam. Uh, first, this is awesome. You've got fans out there, Paul. Um, are there any places in tide pull apps where colors uh, in the visualization are dynamically chosen uh, and thus aren't carefully selected by a human being to ensure contrast compliance? Not right now. Um, as I said, uh, you know, I hang out with Ed, our data scientist, and there are lots of, you know, we do lots of little internal explorations and little, you know, nothing ready for production, nothing that, you know, we'll see the light of day, but there's a lot of exploring and iterating and thinking through our ideas. Um, and so, you know, the, you know, as I mentioned, there are these levers of shape and color, but there's also, you know, you think about there's opacity that you can use and you, you have data overlaying on top of one another. And that's something that Ed and I have been playing a lot with lately. And so, yeah, there's lots of ways that you could dynamically, progr you know, programmatically adjust these variables. Um, but the tide pool web experience you see today, no, not right now. It's all, cool. it's all hand chosen. Uh, our question from Arlene. Thank you, Arlene. I'd love to hear about the other things you're working on for WCAG compliance beyond color to support screen readers, et cetera, maybe another webinar. So yes, uh, there are a number yes. of accessibility focused webinars that I uh, am looking forward to delivering. Um, some of them specifically as it relates to Tide Pool Loop that I can say um, what that actually will look like. Can't say just yet, but uh, we take accessibility. I feel like it's, so we take it seriously. I feel like over the past month internally, there's been a, a real um, sort of momentum to how accessibility is informing the design and the development and actually testing processes at Tidepool. Uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing how we're tackling that. And also more excitingly, how, because of our open source nature, our open and transparent uh, philosophy, how the work that we're doing can be used as a building block for other developers, for other companies, for other apps um, that are looking to leverage uh, the similar sort of thought processes and, and tool sets that we're going to be developing and making open and, and public to everybody else, which is very, very exciting for me. 
Um, two more questions real quick before we get out of here. One, uh, in the resources and links that you're gonna be including, that we will be including in our blog post, um, is there a resource for finding out what cultural connotations um, colors might have around the world? I know that there was a slide, I think at the very end, that you had given a preview of, Paul, is that right? Yes, I flipped through it very briefly. I can screen share. Um, and it's very hard to read in this slide format, so you probably don't want to try and do it here. But yes, there are. there's actually a number of different um, articles and discussions from different designers and different design experts and um, people who have experience with different cultures around the world. And so this here is very hard to read, as I said, but you can look at the letters to understand different cultures from around the world, Native American, Hindu, Muslim, African, South American, um, and then you can look at different emotions and different implications of what those colors necessarily mean. And so you can look at this example here of uh, number 53, which if you take a second, you look, that is love. Um, so some cultures, red is love. You think about Valentine's Day in the Western world in the United States. Uh, but for other cultures, it's yellow or green or blue. And so, you know, just one very small example, but you can look at kind of the, the smattering of different colors all the way around this wheel here and see how you... It, it rotates, the whole thing shifts depending on who you're designing for and what the target market is, or if you're trying to build something that's international and the complexity of that with you know, yeah. using color. Uh, and last question here from James, and I feel like this is the perfect one to end on. Um, awesome talk, Paul. Again, you've got fans out there. Uh, will your slideshow be available, let alone the typo color system TM um, or a spreadsheet? Uh, so in terms of publicly available, open and radically transparent, what is available now and what will be available, I guess, by the time the blog post gets published? Yeah, so I think we can, once we publish the YouTube video, Chris, I think we could, I could just, I made these slides, they're, they're like, I can just publish them and make them available and we can link to them. Um, Chris, I'm sure you can tweet them out before the blog post is ready, maybe along with the YouTube video. And then yeah. when the blog post goes up, we can link to both of them in the top of the page. Um, and I can also, uh, I, I don't see any reason not to link to the, the color palettes and the, the, the grid of different colors and different accessibility rates. Um, so that can all go out as one sort of package even before the blog post is ready. Yeah, so James, we'll put out a couple of links on our Twitter account, typepool underscore org. Um, and then more importantly, the blog post will be a comprehensive sort of one-stop shop for all the design uh, goodies that Paul has been highlighting here throughout the past now hour long presentation on um, this discussion. I'm, oh, hey look, the Nori cam everybody. If you stuck around long enough, we made it hey, to Nori. Nori. <laughs> That doing? right there is a perfect note to end this on. Um, thank you everybody for attending uh, this uh, webinar talking about accessible color design. Um, Paul, thank you for taking the time to give this presentation. Um, I, I, I continue to learn a lot whenever anybody at Tidepool talks about the nerdy stuff that they are super passionate about. Um, I'm looking forward to bringing you back for a future um, discussion around how we manage scales and logarithmic stuff and get add on for a separate webinar on that too. Um, but thank you again, Paul. All right. Yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone for showing up, for hanging out, for the questions. Um, and honestly, like any critique, I welcome it. Um, you know, it, it makes the system better. And so if there are things that I'm doing wrong, please tell me. Um, I yeah. look forward to your feedback. Perfect. When in doubt, send us a message to support at tidepool.org and we will get back to you one way or another. Uh, that'll be it for today's webinar. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks. Bye.